It's time to feel the rage. Welcome to Film Rage, where we talk movies. We're exclusively streaming again this week for the seventh week in a row. The Austro-Prussian War of 1866 took seven weeks. The Kingdom of Prussia prevailed over the Austrian Empire in that one. Sorry, I've lost my train of thought again. Where was I? Oh yeah, directors and actors beware as you cannot hide from the rage. My name is Bryce, and I'm part of the Film Rage crew, which also includes Jim, by a some sort of long-distance talking device. Hello, Jim. Hey, hey. So, with the introductions out of the way, oh, let's rage on. Okay, as usual, we have a jam-packed agenda today. So, this week, we're going to be streaming. We're going to talk about our list. In this case, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe Bryce has one, maybe not. Um, film genre faves for animated films uh, Open Rage, Rage or Dare Contest winners and closing Alright, well You want to hit me with some music, baby? Yeah, I can do that Streaming. Okay, well, I'm very excited that today we're going to get to talk about uh, a film called Sword of God, or also known as The Mute from 2018. Now, this played via our friends at Calgary International Film Festival. Uh, this is off Sip at Home their program and access through the, the URL siscalgary.ca so anybody who's listening to this be it Canada, US the world you should be able to uh, check that out and be able to stream this film we're trying to do as much as we can to support uh, our local friends uh, at Calgary Film and uh, Calgary International Film Fest they, they're going through a rebranding right now but um, anybody who gets a chance uh, get a chance to stream this and Check out what's, what's streaming. The film festivals need our money. Otherwise, they may not survive. So uh, let's talk about Sword of God. All right. So this was a dark motherfucking Inquisition shit from Poland. And uh, wow, this is from Sif Page. Uh, directed by Academy Award nominated filmmaker. I'm going to pronounce his name badly I'm sure Bartosz Kanapka this uh, genre bending historical epic Bartosz Kanopka uh, oh thank you my Polish friend um, previously titled The Mute has been hailed as a stunning showcase of experimental horror by Bloody Disgusting that strikes the brutal clarity uh, from screen anarchy uh, so I actually, this is a mondo for me. I love this film. It was so dark and so, and what I really liked, <clears throat> what I really liked about it is that um, I had no clue what was going on for the first half an hour of this movie. I basically, as I'm watching it, I'm going like, okay, what's happening here? Why is this? Like, I, I love that. I like to feel uncomfortable in my seat when I'm watching a film. And you know me, I like weird. And I also like, um, to challenge my senses. And this film did that for me a lot because I really wasn't really sure. And so I had to go through the film and go through the journey that the director was bringing forward to have me sort of be really fully understand it. And actually, after I saw the movie, I went back and watched the first half an hour again because I was like, okay. It started to make a little bit more sense and I did a little bit more reading on it. And I love that. Like if a movie still perks my interest, um, I want to go back and learn more about what the content is and I mean, who doesn't love uh, Spanish Inquisition? In this case, it was Polish Inquisition. But um, still, you know what? <laughs> I don't know why there's a there's a theme going through this year of uh, Catholic movies that, um, for me, I'm I'm loving. Uh, I, I don't know what's your thoughts on it. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I can't say that I didn't like it, um, but I didn't love it. Um, as I say, I, I found parts of it a little confusing while you were like enthralled with it and wanted to learn more. I was just, you know, like, eh, that was confusing. 
Um, I did like it a lot. Pacing was good. While it was a pretty simple story, um, two men arrive at a place where they try to convert the natives to Christianity to win favor for their with their king. Um, you know, pretty simple. Um, but some of the motivations of the natives, natives kind of left me a little confused. I wasn't sure why they were kind of, and I, I don't know. And I guess part of that is that we never know what they're actually saying because there's only subtitles. Um, yeah, for, which you know, I kind of like. Which, that, which, I, which I, normally I would like, but I, I honestly, I didn't know what they were, why they were following either of them. Um, like, I don't know. I'm um, still. It was well acted. Um, with some scenes involving fire that have really stayed with me. Um, there, there was a lot of burning in this movie. Um, yes, burning. And it was all really symbolic and really, you know, it was it, it was good stuff. Um, well, well made movie. Um, but overall, I didn't like. I did like it, but not enough to give it more than a meh. Well, I can understand it. For me, I, I guess I really stepped into the whole thought of the the one lead character, that one priest. That, was he the cardinal or was he a... He was higher up than just a priest. Yeah. Like he was higher up the food chain. And, um, like, it, it really it brings back to the whole politics of Catholicism in that whole era and you know me i'm not really a big fan of period pieces but I'm, I'm not a big fan of the whole pomp and circumstance that is maybe the french revolution or you know british high tea type yeah well and you, you got no pomp and circumstance in this movie yeah it was so it was it was dirty, gritty dirty. it was dirty and grimy everything i love about like a it's i, I don't think you can even call it a horror film it wasn't so much a horror it was a, it was more like a, a drama thriller. Like I had no clue what was going to happen. Like the end part, I kind of suspected, but mm -hmm. I loved it. It was kind of like, okay, you just totally knocked my socks off. Like, yeah, if you're going to, I kind of want to tell the spoiler because it's really so good. This guy who, who felt he had, like the priest who felt he had won the, uh, you know, he actually did his job. Like I've converted people and I've, you know, killed people to get there, and I've done what I had to do. Burned witches at stakes, done whatever I had to do to get to get to this point. I've converted them. I'm a good Catholic. Yeah. But uh, and then, <laughs> of course, when the king shows up, yeah, it's just yeah, it's, that's a, yeah, it's, that's enough said. But yeah, it's uh, it as I say, it was good, and I, I, you know, it's 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 worth watching. Um, I can't say that it's not. But it wasn't, as I say, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't give it a mondo. Um, it can't sounds it like, mondo, right? sounds like we were kind of on the same line there and you just fell to the mondo side. I fell, fell to the mess side. And I think we kind of agree on, on, on the movie as, as a whole. Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's a strong, it's a strong film. It tells a strong picture. I think if you like that darkness, then you're going to like this more. Which you, I mean, you usually like Generally, I do, but I don't know. It's, yeah, so for whatever reason, you fell off the turnip truck this week. Yeah, sometimes it happens. You know, All right, from sort of... Rolling. Yes, from, <laughs> from sort of God and all that darkness, we go to actually, I guess, a little little darkness with this one too, really. Um, yeah, we, it's we, kind of a weird... It, it is. So we got the Willoughbys, which I believe streaming on Netflix, yes? Yes. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, the Willoughby's, uh, animated film, um, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was about some young siblings who decide that they would be better off if they were orphans. Um, so in a nutshell, they try to kill off their parents by sending them on a very dangerous vacation. Um, the movie starts out quite bleak yet, you know, extremely amusing and slowly lightens up with the introduction of Linda, the nanny who is hired to take care of the kids while the parents take their vacation. Um, it is her introduction that turns this film from kind of dark comedy to family entertainment, really. Um, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I probably would have preferred if it kind of stayed dark and bleak, but alas, it is a children's movie, so I don't know. It, was, it wasn't exclusively made for me, unfortunately. Um, I found myself caring for all the Willoughby children, though. Um, they all came across sympathetically in their own way, um, and the fact that the twins, both named Barnaby, shared the same sweater, passing it back and forth when they felt the other was cold, was <laughs> it, it amused me like every time they exchanged the garment. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, early on, when their sister Jane asked the parents Barnabys, if the Barnabys could have another sweater, their parents deny the request. Um, but the Barnabys, they take this, this in stride, proclaiming, one is good, we like one. Um... <laughs> So it showed not only the bond between the two, but you know, the genuine affection that they shared, um, at its heart, this movie 
of an un, uh, is of an unconventional family coming together um, through trust and all in all the movie just works um, real good kids movie um, lots of stuff for the adults as well um, I would give it a mondo that what I also think I thought it was fun I love the I, I, I love the darkness like it just it's the beginning <laughs> Oh, the, at the beginning, I thought I, this is going to be my favorite movie ever, but it, yeah. it it got a little lighter as it went along. But yeah, the beginning, I was yeah, like, this is little, awesome. It got a little cutesy yeah. Yeah, through it. So, I mean, I'm a big Will Forte fan. Um, I love him and everything. I don't know why. I just. Yeah, I think he's, he's always entertaining. And, and so, yeah, this is I could see this totally becoming a an animated series. Like uh, maybe Netflix is trying it out. As because I think it was a Netflix production, wasn't it? Yep, it was. My memory serves me correctly, so and it does. I can see this becoming a an animated series on uh, on Netflix pretty quick. Obviously, with less production values, but mm. this is totally fun. Martin Short's voice too, like yeah. come on, <laughs> like you know it's him right off the right off the bat, right? Yeah. Uh, and Ricky Gervais as a cat, like yeah, um, yeah, it's real fun. Everybody this was spot on. It's good stuff. Yeah, I loved it. All right. Well, we're moving into now. This one we have alluded to this a long time ago because during the Oscar run, we talked a little bit about it. You, I think you saw it back then, didn't you? Yeah, I saw it. I uh, yeah, I saw it before the Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking now about Pain and Glory. So um, this is the one that Antonio Banderas is nominated for an Oscar for. Um, I thought it was a great uh, film arc uh, of a complex character. I loved how he moved so seamlessly in and out, like the director, how he moved seamlessly in and out of different time frames. We've talked about this in the past. And I know you don't like where they go, it's now 1974 and this is what's happening. So I liked, I really liked that about it. Yeah. Um, uh, director, writer, uh, Pedro Almodovar. Almodovar. Thank you, my Spanish friend. Um, I thought he did an okay job of it. You know what? It what lost me more was I thought the character development, and you know me, big on character development. I thought his character was developed really well defined. Um, I just found I was not falling in love with the rest of the characters, and I, you know, I've got as much as I either have to. I, it's kind of how we feel about men, right? It's kind of like I've got to love a character, or I've got to hate a character, and I think I just felt that they didn't put enough in it. To make you like even when he came out as being gay um it was kind of like you like as we're watching it we're going like my wife and i when she watched it with me in this one um we're watching this is this the time when he goes gay when the guy with the huge wiener has the shower in front of him and then he passes out from heat, heat exhaustion i'm like okay that was mo- not even monumental like you, if, if someone was actually like didn't show any emotion in his character if you know what i'm saying yeah it was so a I, little I thought odd. that there was parts of it through the movie that there should have been more emotion within the characters as the way they were developing it and it didn't get there originally i had thought i was going to give this a mondo just because of um antonio's performance yeah he was really for, good and for his character arc um, but overall uh, on, on retrospect of it, it it couldn't get to mondo for me it just ended up being a man what about, what about you? Well, I have now watched this movie twice. Um, I had to <laughs> I had to rewatch it as I had forgotten it and was uh, informed we were reviewing it. We were reviewing it this week, so I guess I need to brush up on what I had saw, seen. Um, I'm not sure why this film is completely fruitless for me. Um, the acting is fine. It is a very pretty movie to look at, as mm. Alma Dabar movies tend to be. Um, the story of a man turning to heroin to block out not only the pain from his chronic physical problems, but perhaps also the pain from some of his decisions from his past is intriguing. Um, but this ultimately falls flat for me. Um, I find that uh, Alma Devar movies all tend to be good, but for me, they're never great. Um, a lot yeah. of people will disagree with me on that because there's some. There's some major backers of this guy. They think he's a genius, but uh, hey, but that's how but that's how I feel. 
Yeah. Not an Academy Award nod. Oh, for, exactly. Uh, for it, right? So, but, yeah, some big buzz for it. But honestly, this guy, I mean, from bad ed- education to talk to her, to the skin I live in, to Volver, to this film, Pain and Glory, they all have one thing in common. They are all meh. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and none of them are bad, and there's good in all of them, but at the end of the day, it's just, eh, it was all right. Um, yep. And, uh, oh, and by the way, is using just his last name a new thing? I hadn't really noticed. Um, it said directed by not Pedro Almodovar, but directed by just Almodovar. No first name. Pretty pretentious, Pedro. Pretty pretentious. Yeah, like it's kind of like, are you in the army now or what? Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, yeah no. Alamar, Alamar. <laughs> Perfect. So, yeah, so, no, I think we're pretty much in agreement on that one, my friend. Yeah, that's a double math. That's a double math. It is. Bam. Uh, okay, you're going to talk about uh, some lesbian baseball players, I think. I think you are correct, although they really should have spent more time on that. I'm actually not going to say too much about this. Um, movie's called A Secret Love, um, also streaming on Netflix. Um, and a doc. And it is a doc, yes. Um, so, I don't know, man. A Secret Love is a story of Terry Donahue and Pat Henschel. Um, Terry and Pat fell in love in 1947. They stayed together as, you know, people in love tend to do. This was a documentary about their 65 plus years together. Not sure why this was supposed to compel me. Um, they were both quite likable, but neither were overly interesting. It is a simple talking heads doc that I can sum up with one word. Meh. <laughs> Tell me why I should care more, Jim. Well, you know, when I think about it, uh, there's a there's a uh, journey arc that we're doing within our um, within our film reviews here that um, you know, <laughs> although it didn't make it to rage, so I got to give you kudos for that. No, but you, are you a, couldn't rage you've about already, it. <laughs> you've already been ousted by the one armed uh, surfer community. So, <laughs> you know, thing, I'm thinking maybe that may have played some of the part on it. I don't, I don't think you should have cared more about this. As I watched this movie, I was so excited. Like, the film had so much promise. And it's, it's directed and written by one of their, um, Chris Boland. Uh, so, obviously, they're really connected to these two people. And, yeah, you know, the, the 10 minutes or whatever they talked about the baseball, that's the journey I wanted to go on. Like, it was... And people may hate me for this too. Um, uh, Brokeback Mountain, you know, got so much press and so much, and maybe you love it too. I, I actually really liked it. I did not think it was a good movie. It was and a very good movie because to me, it was just a love story. It didn't even have to have a, a gay stream to it. it. It did, which was you know great because we need more uh, gay films in the in the mainstream. But um, this was just a love story of two people that you know. The coolest thing about them wasn't the fact that they were uh, they were gay or lesbian for 65 years and had to hide from themselves, which they really didn't talk too much about that. Uh, it was more about the peripherals of what was going on in their family life. And, it, and I think that the life that they had outside was way more interesting. They should have delved more into that. So I don't think you should have cared much more because I think that they, they could have done a lot more with these if they're the characters themselves seem like they were said so much more to offer and it didn't get to get blown out in this movie. You. Yep. So yeah, it's a mess for me. Almost got to a rage. But <laughs> it, it was <laughs> just because I wanted so much more for it and uh, it just didn't get there. Yeah, it's the, disappointing. The too high. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're moving on to another dog. And this one I had so much hope for. This is called Planet of the Humans, and this is uh, from 2019. It is um, directed and written by Jeff Gibbs, and executive producer is Michael Moore, yeah. one of the executive producers. So um, I had so much high hopes for this because I know both you and I both are pretty big supporters of, of green um, lifestyle. And this, I'm not angry because it kind of kicked us in the nuts and said, uh, okay, guess what? The whole world is terrible. Wow. Well, 
you'll sure kill yourself now. You, you must have known a lot of this going in, though. Like, Yeah, I mean, you do know. I mean, obviously, solar panels are not the greatest thing to make. Uh, but once they're made, they do have a lot. Now, I, I like the things that I did like about it. I did like that he was very... Um, he, he was very dedicated to the cause of finding out some of this information. But it just became tedious after a while for me because I'm like, okay, yeah, we know that already. You're not giving me anything new. And part of the thing that bothered me so much was like, I don't know if it was <clears throat> Michael Moore liked this movie and wanted executive to produce it because the guy tried to sound like him so much through the whole movie. And I was just like, why am I this? He sounds exactly like my, like he was almost like he was trying to make a Michael Moore movie to you know, suck up to Michael Moore or something. More often than not, there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's a lot wrong with that. Be, be your own thing. Like I didn't, as I was watching it, I wasn't feeling, oh, you're, you've got a vision, uh, Chris Bolin, and I now see what your vision is. I was watching this going, this is like a, a C or a C minus rating of a Michael Moore film. And uh... then it just didn't, didn't deliver for me because at the end, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, great. The world is going to hell. And there was no hope. There was no, there's no nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. The right? It's, yeah. Like, <clears throat> no, I, I was not happy. Well, I didn't hate, it didn't get me to rage. It was a meh. And I think I loved, I loved the fact that it gave us the things, but you know, tell us some other, tell us things that, that we don't know. Okay. Like there was nothing that we didn't know. It was just kind of like com combining it all together and showing us things that we already knew. No, well, not a, not everybody knows it though, and and no, it was and it was. There's been too they, many documentaries before that have done a very similar thing. Tell us what the next thing is going to be. Like, don't it was, to me the documentary. But what if there isn't a next thing, Jim? There is a next. What thing. if the I'm next sure thing is that you know we all need to just consume less? Or how about well the whole <laughs> the whole thing is you just the message was. People just need to die more. <laughs> I don't know that that was a message. Anyways, my take on it is, you know, it was a pretty bleak doc that packages a lot of things that I already knew into one depressing dose of reality. Um, I have always been puzzled by the expression going green referring to biofuel. How can burning trees for fuel be going green? Um, yeah, or burning food in general. Yeah, th this, this doc doesn't know either. Um, it showed us that in many cases, by getting rid of one coal plant to go green with a solar plant, they also build two natural gas plants to supply most of the energy, as while solar is a nice idea, its energy cannot be efficiently collected or stored. So, it is the natural gas plants that do the heavy lifting when it comes to energy consumption. So we basically exchange one polluting power plant for three polluting power plants so we can go green. That is some bad math. Um, it also touches on green illusions such as wind energy and electric cars, and it goes on about those as well. Um, but what it boils down to is whether you choose to buy into the, this documentary 100% or not, you at least have to admit that there are no easy answers when it comes to energy. And that was what the, the whole thing was telling us. Um, and that's why they, they touched upon all of those things, because um, there's just no easy answers when it comes to energy. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as clean energy on a grand scale. The only answer is to consume less, which is not the way we do things here in North America. Um, it is always interesting when a doc follows the money as well. Um, there are many examples of it here as we see known polluters funding some of these green illusions. Um, the one I found most amusing is those wacky planet killers, the Koch brothers own Georgia Pacific, who has been poisoning the planet for years. Now, Georgia Pacific owns the website treehuggers.com. This is the world we live in, Jim. For, sh yep. for shining a light on some of the shady claims of green energy, I have no choice but to give this film a very depressing mondo. Yeah, no, you're wrong. It's not a mondo. <laughs> I love to be depressed. Don't get me wrong. I just feel um, okay. So one thing, obviously, it's 2019. They didn't get to see the um, um, Bill Gates documentary series on Netflix. I mean, it's even. But what Bill Gates has been doing with nuclear power uh, is the future. Yeah, and, and the new and the nuclear power, you know, 
I, I would love it if if that if that's if this all comes to fruition and hopefully it does um but that's you, you got to get rid of a lot of people before that ever happens a lot too many yeah, people making good. money jim right no and bryce i'm not don't get me wrong i i get that what he was trying to do with it and i most of that i knew already anyway and i'm glad that they brought it to light to people but for him, not, not everybody, have, not, it, not everybody is as informed as you though, Jim. And I thought this presented no, 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 in a way no, that, that it, it was an eye, eye opener. Moore, it's another Michael Moore, Moore crony clone of Michael Moore who wants to tell a one-sided story without giving anything else. Yeah. Save it for your rage, Jim. Oh yeah. I'm going to build this rage. To, it's just starting to bubble in right now. So it's going to overflow. But yeah, this was this couldn't get above man for me because I felt he just had too one-sided of an opinion and didn't give us anything else that's going on. And there's a lot of creative things going on in green energy right now that he just forget forgot to tell people. Mm, he, it wasn't he, so much that he forgot to tell people, but none of none of it is actually at a point where it can it can do anything at this point until well, until we can actually debate. get to that point. We can save that debate for another time. All right. But for now. You gave it a Mondo, I gave it a man. Just like that. Just like that. So. Now, we got lists. Lists, people. No, we don't. You've got, uh, got, you got a list. submission first, man. I got a submission first? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the list. The list, the mission. Oh, I thought you were talking about our animation <laughs> list. <laughs> no, no. Oh. Our list. Got it, got yeah, it, got so it. Do you have one this week? Nah, it's all, it's on you. Oh, it's all on me. Well, I was saving two. I'm only going to give you one then. Yeah, let's go through one. Bad, you've been a bad boy. And trying to come up with something just makes my brain hurt too much. I'll I know. I'll take another stab at it. I want to take a real yeah. good stab though. I want it. I want it to actually go through. I I've been submitting stuff that I just knew that was just going to hit our speed bump. So. I'm, I'm waiting for yeah. that one that's going to go all the way through because, you know, doubt, getting a doubted, that's too easy. Mesmerized, got, got, that's too easy. I need to come up with an undoubted. Yeah, well, we got two from last week that are potentials. You still got to watch a bunch of movies from one. And we got another one. We just got to wait till October, November when it comes yeah. out. He's, he's, got, he's already he's already undoubted. There's no there's no question. Yeah. that the, I mean, it, exactly. it's not going to be a rage. So that means he's yeah. undoubted. But. He's undoubted. Wes Anderson's going to make it. Yep. Uh, so my submission this week is from my good buddy, David Cronenberg. Mm. And I will go through his last um, his last eight films for you. Do it. So that you have. Uh, so in 2014, he did Consumed. Oh, that's a short, so we don't want that. The so last movie, Map of the Stars, for me, that was a Mondo. Meh. Okay. Cosmopolis. That was, for me was a meh. Mondo. Okay. Uh, Dangerous Method. That was a Mondo. For mondo. Me. Eastern Promises was a Mondo. <laughs> mondo. Yeah. Uh, uh, to Each His Own Cinema. Is this an actual. What? No, it's no. No, this is um, collecting a collection of 33 shorts. Yeah. No. Uh, History of Violence. Mondo. mondo. Spider, for me, it was a meh. Mondo. Okay. Um, Existence, for me, that was a mondo. mondo. Crash was a Mondo. Mondo. And Butterfly, I'm already, like, we're already at, I'm positive. You can count it up. He's in. He's done it. Okay. And Butterfly was a Mondo. Mondo. Crash was a Mondo. Existence was a Mondo. Uh, Spider was a meh for me, but it was a Mondo. Mondo for me. History of Violence. Mondo, Eastern Promises was a Mondo, Dangerous Method, Mon yeah, he's in, man. It's, 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 Congratulations, it's Jim. He's in. Yeah, baby. Yeah, and for me, I could go back even further. Everything is either a meh or Mondo, mostly Mondos. Naked Lunch was the only one that was a meh for me. The Mondo. Lunch, it gave up their meh. Dead Ringers, both of us. Oh. Like super, super. Mondo. 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 Uh, the Fly, Mondo. Uh, that's, by the way, that... Dead Ringers is my my father's favorite horror movie, even though he's not around anymore. But he just there you go. He shocked the hell out of me when he came home and said, "I just saw the greatest movie ever." <laughs> I was like, "What?" And he said, "Dead Ringers." I'm like, "You're kidding, right?" He's like, "No, I loved it." I'm like, "All right, cool." 
Well, your dad seems like a pretty cool dude. I yeah, wish he was, I met a, him. He was a pretty cool Dead dude. Dead Ringers is also up there for me. And then The Fly, Mondo. Absolutely. Dead Zone, Mondo. Yes. Video Drum, Mondo. Yes. Scanners, Mondo. Yep. The Brood, Super Duper, Fabamundo, <laughs> Mondo. Super Duper, Fabamundo. Rabid, Mondo. Yep. Shivers, Mondo. Like, everything he does. Is the man does himself. no wrong. Wow, I can't believe that it never crossed my mind before this. But yeah, no, nope, well, he you know is what? in. I'm focusing on directors these days. Actors, they make too many stupid oh, decisions. Even the best the actors just make are. the dumbest choices sometimes. Yeah, they're like, I gotta feed myself more money because I got addictions to houses and cars and women and coke and yes. stuff. I gotta do a crap coke movie and, and stuff. Money. I don't know why my voice went to like Southern Alabama for this one, but mm -hmm. it wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was thinking of Tommy Lee Jones. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's been in a lot of bad movies. That's well, true. all right. So this week. We've got our friend David Cronenberg joining the Undoubted. Cool. All right. All right. From there, we are going. Do, do. And for some reason, my finger is not working, but don't worry. It's under control. All right. There you go. You did have your finger bang there. So, we are doing our favorite films uh, in the animation category. Think yes, we are. Yes. And I've got another surprise for you. Our buddy Murray, who's in, is in uh, sabbatical right now. Okay, how many, did it, how many did it give us? Three? He never gives us no. ten for some reason. What's that about? He's always, he, you know, Murray. He, he just always leaves us wanting, wanting more. All right. That's right. He knows how to drop a mic, and when he drops it, he drops it hard, baby. All right. So let's start with his, Murray then. What has he got for us? His, his top movies, and they're in no order. So whereas we, with you and I, we probably put them in an order. Yep. With Murray, you get what you get, got and you better like it. Top movies, so animation. Is Fox and the Hound, Lion King. Toy Story, The Peanuts Movie, and Shrek. I think that might be The Peanuts Movie. Peanuts Movie? No, Peanuts. Peanuts? That's what I said. What did I say? You said penis. I said peanuts. Peanuts. That's not what I heard. <laughs> well, what's going on in your mind? I said penis. Uh, I don't think you did. Is it my Tirana accent that sometimes comes through sometimes? Maybe that's what it is. Give them to me one more time, though. That was Murray's top five? Yeah, it's Murray's uh, Fox and the Hound. Yep. The Lion King. Yep. Toy Story. Yep. The Penis. Movie. Yep. <laughs> Penis. Movie. A Shrek. That is a solid list. I like it. Yeah, me too. Especially the Penis movie. I yeah. can say that all day. <laughs> all, right, all right, man. Well, I'll jump on mine. Usually honorable mentions. I only got five this week. Cause Roll with it. Uh, I didn't want to come off sounding too big of a fan as a, you know, I don't want to take myself too far back to my childhood, but I watched a shitload of these back on the weekend just to make sure I liked them. Mm. So number five is Soul Station, uh, or Soryu You Luck, directed by Sang Ho Yun. Is that the Train to Busan thing? Yes, it is. a sequel to Train to Busan. This movie helped to develop one of the best zombie movies ever made. Cool. Number four by Don Blues. Wow, the futuristic epic is a blazing. Blues seems to always take a story and layer it intertwined into animated masterpieces. This is Titan AE. Mm. Uh, number three is Iron Giant. This is a classic. Nothing else needs to be said. Yep. Uh, number two, Wallace and Gromit, The Wrong Trousers. <clears throat> this is my first exposure to Nick Park. I've loved him ever since. Uh, uh, this just fortifies my belief in my passion for cheese grommet. Uh, number one for honorable mentions is Chicken Run, also Nick Park. Mm. Um, I said, I, I do love you, but I couldn't get you into the top ten, buddy. Sorry about that. Um, but you still get to keep two of the honorable mentions. You should be pretty happy about that. I'm sure he's super pumped about me giving him two honorable mentions. Oh, I'm sure he's just absolutely thrilled. Exactly. I'm gonna, we'll tag him in this on our Instagram. Um, number 10, another Don Bluth, uh, Secret of Nim. Uh, this is probably his most complex uh, film, in my opinion, and based on a brilliant writer, uh, Robert O'Brien's masterpiece. Uh, 
Uh, number nine, My Neighbor Totoro, directed by, I always get this wrong, Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, amazing adventure escapism for traumatized kids. This was one of my kids and my favorite films. We used to watch this all the time. I have not it's, seen it. Uh, his, his stuff is is brilliant at the best of times. Uh, you know, Japanese animation that's just, wow. Cool. Like, th- I think you should watch this one first. I know your buddy Kim is uh, is a big fan of his work. And, and to me, this is his best, but that's because I fell in love with the characters right from day one. It's about two, two daughters and their mom is dying. And uh, they go on this journey together with uh, Totoro. It's just, it's brilliant. Cool. Uh, number eight, The Incredibles. Best animated superhero film ever. Just great on every level. I rewatched this on the weekend too. Love this film. It's all right. Number seven. Well, you're just all right. Uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I'm giving this an animation live action film. It's the best live action animated film ever made in my opinion. Uh, ties all the cartoons of our history into one big fantastic adventure with an added bonus planting unpure thoughts for dirty old men like me thinking about hot cartoons rabbit wise delicious mm. number six as close as we're going to get to um, cartoon porn our friend Ralph Bakshi delivers Fritz the Cat Fritz the Cat um, the first X rated cartoon that ever was I want more and more yes and more uh number five i love dogs by wes anderson japan style so amazing so um good. number four uh this is a bit of a surprise i'm not sure if you've seen this one uh this almost i had did my top four were tough for me i had to battle between all of them to make the decision number four is twice upon a time the adult version which i've only seen once um, which is it's almost impossible to find uh, produced by George Lucas and directed by uh, John Cordy and Charles Swenson uh, if you have you seen this movie I haven't it's you know you can see it the edited version the um, what there's so much if you go look at the history of this movie online it just didn't it was one of the last lad company uh, productions and um, they had to throw money at another film. That's why this didn't get as much. But this should have been the biggest animated feature uh, of its time. And it just wasn't. It's brilliant. Cool. Um, number, number three is up. This Disney gem blew my mind. I have never seen a cartoon that made me cry for 20 solid minutes starting straight away and then bring me to so much joy. I love this movie. Up is my number three. Cool. Number two. And this is where we're going to have an argument, I know. That number two is the fantastic Mr. Fox. <sighs> what can I say? Perhaps the only director that could produce um, every movie as a Mondo. It's <laughs> crazy, Mondo. isn't it? Uh, there, There is not a flaw in this film, but one film has just a little bit more horror than joy, which is my number one. I can't wait and to hear. And cannot allow joy to win over horror. All right. Can we? Can we? I could. Yes. I like joy. Are, I know. Yeah. Sometimes you surprise me with how much joy you like. Oh, well. My number one. Okay. I don't, don't think I have to give you too much on this. I was going to break it all down, but I'm just going to tell you flat out. Number one on my list. Favorite of all time. I've seen this movie. It's got to be well over 200 times. 200 times. Yeah, easily. Watch That's it. crazy. I even... I, I probably if I could add it might even be a thousand times like I know at least 200 for sure uh, is The Nightmare Before Christmas 1993 written by Tim Burton directed by Henry Selleck yep. uh, with the voice talents of Chris Sarandon Catherine O'Hara William Hickey and that's right Pee Wee himself Paul Rubens Paul Rubens uh, is in it musical science horror uh, holidays poisoning slavery uh, it's all in there that ties horror music and comedy into a story that stands the test of time and is beholden to both kids and adults alike. Tim Burton's vision brought to life by the genius of Henry Fellett. I love this movie. I watched it again on the weekend and I'm just like, yeah, as much as <laughs> I kept I was watching it again on the weekend, I'm kind of like, holy crap, this thing is dark as fuck. Like, it really is. This, you know, like, and, and so what makes this 
I'm so beholden to this one so much is I have two daughters and they're both in their, you know, my old, youngest is in their late twenties and my, my um, so you're going to get an idea of how old I am. Everybody listening. And my oldest is in her early thirties. And when this movie came out, my youngest, this was her favorite movie at age one or two, whatever it was. She watched this every day, every day. She couldn't like it for my oldest daughter was Bambi. And for her, it was the nightmare before Christmas. So I watched this all the time. The music was on all the time. And uh, I was just like, man, she's got a little cold, dead black heart, just like her father. Number one. Cool. How about you, buddy? All right. Well, what were we doing again? Animation? That's it. Animation. Did, all you, right. did you find 10? Oh, yeah. I found 10. We got three honorable mentions. Um, first, we'll go right. Corpse Bride 2005, Creepy Fun with Tim Burton. Starring Johnny Depp and Helena, Helena Bonham Carter, um, with a brilliant score from Danny Elfman. Um, then my honorable mention is The Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, oh, 1990, it didn't even make my top 10. How's that possible? Uh, 1993, more creepy fun from Tim Burton and, as you say, uh, our, our boy Selleck. Um, and a brilliant score from, um, who was that? Oh, Danny Elfman. Um, then we got... Uh, Coraline is my other honorable mention from 2009. Even more creepy fun with, wait for it, a brilliant score from Danny Elfman. And once again, our boy Selleck's involved with that one too, directing. So um, really good stuff. And now for my top 10 animated films of all time. That was quite the drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> Number 10, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut from 1999. A lot of fun with some genuine laugh-out-loud moments. We also learned what Brian Boitano would do. Apparently, he'd make a plan and he'd follow through. That's what Brian Boitano would do. Number yeah, Canada sucks. <laughs> yeah, well, blame <laughs> Canada. Yeah, that's right. Number 9, Beavis and Butthead do America. 1996. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead go on a quest to find their missing television set. That is the plot. All I have to say is Mike Judge is a genius. Number eight. Nine from 2009. This has Elijah Wood, Crispin Glover, and John C. Riley all in the same movie. Not to mention Christopher Plummer and Martin Landau. What an unbelievably awesome cast. Ragdolls yeah. versus Soul Stealing Monsters. Good stuff, man. Yep, good movie. Number seven. Up from 2009. You knew, some, you, you knew some Disney had to be coming. Um, hard to ignore this one as the opening few minutes is as good as it gets as far as, far as getting yourself invested in a character. Um, Ed Asner is so good as the voice of Carl Fredrickson, the, the 70 year, 78 year old main character of this excellent movie. Um, it, the movie also taught me something. It taught me that, you know, I should enjoy the little things in life because one day I will look back and realize they were the big things. Number six, Wally -E from 2008. Let's keep the Disney train rolling. Um, I cannot believe I ended up caring about a trash collecting robot as much as I did. One of the most lovable characters ever. Number five, the Lego movie from 2014. Um, it was just fun. Um, one hour and 40 minutes of fun. Um, clever references throughout to keep the laughs steady. Um, and I think this movie proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is only one true Batman, Will Arnett brilliant portrayal number four aqua teen hunger force colon movie film for theaters from 2007 <laughs> if you like the aqua teen hunger force then you probably love this movie and if you do not like the aqua teen hunger force then you are dumb it is that simple Frylock, Meatwad, and Master Shake take us on a mind-bending adventure in this spectacular ride of a movie. Number three. And to be honest, when we get to my top three, these are by far, like there is such a gap to my previous ones to these top three, it's not even funny. These are the three 
very, very best animated movies ever. Number three, Isle of Dogs from 2018. The soon-to-be undoubted Wes Anderson story of a boy searching for his lost dog. Just like everything Wes Anderson does, this movie is brilliant. Number two, Mary and Max from 2009. I literally just watched this movie last weekend. I stumbled across it by chance, and a few days later, it's my number two animated movie of all time. How does this absolute gem of a movie fly under my radar for over 10 years? I mean, it stars Tony Collette and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Seriously, how did I not know about this movie? Anyways, I don't know. It's yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Anyway, it is great, and if it passed you by as well, you need to seek it out and watch it. Um, the pr- the no, premise. I've seen it. Yep. The premise is kind of creepy, you know, as it's an eight-year-old girl from Australia becomes pen pals with a 44-year-old man in New York. Um, but it's amazing that from that premise blossoms one of the most heartwarming stories that I've ever seen with laugh-out-loud moments throughout. I adore this movie. If you haven't seen it, seek it out. Um, it is so worth it. And and there's no surprise here with my number one, The Fantastic Mr. Fox from 2009. Uh, the soon-to-be undoubted Wes Anderson again. I believe I've said it before, but this was the best thing that both George Clooney and Meryl Streep have ever done. Um, this cast is ridiculous, as it also stars Bill Murray, Willem Dafoe, Owen Wilson, Jason Schwartzman, Brian Cox, and Adrian Brody. Um, it also introduces us to the game of Whack Bats, which is awesome. The rules of whack bats are real simple. There are three grabbers, three taggers, five twig runners, and a player at whack bat. The center tagger lights a pine cone and chucks it over the basket, and the whack bat batter tries to hit the cedar stick off the cross rock. The twig runners dash back and forth until the pine cone burns out. Then you count up however many score downs it adds up to, and then you divide by nine. And that is how you play whack bat. It's simple. Anyways... Long story, it is simple. Uh, Long story short, I do not believe there is a movie out there that makes me as happy as this one does. It's absolutely the best animated movie ever. Yeah, you're wrong, but it's it's the second best. I can give you that. Yeah, your your number one gets an honorable mention. (laughs) Good good list, buddy. I I liked every one of those. So yeah. I, you know, that's the thing about animation. It's tough, I think, for people to get it wrong. It is. You yeah, know, yeah. Can, can I say that any of your movies didn't, you know, I, you know, other than the ones I didn't see. Um, but, yeah. yeah, everything you said, I can't argue with any of that. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, it, it's, so animation is just such a great craft that they can, and creatively, right? Like, for me, a lot of it is about the different types. Like, I Love Dog is completely different type of animation than say who framed Roger Rabbit or The Incredibles right which is so digital focused right and then yeah I I I like I wanted to stay for me anyway I wanted to stay focused on a few different types but then you just can't argue with the fact that certain ones are just iconically beautifully shot and well done because the characters are great great list buddy all right so from that we uh we got to get there was too much happiness going on there so it's time to get a little angry my friend. Oh yeah, I'm, it's there. Temperature rising. Vision blurring. Rage taking over. Well, my rage this week, I've already alluded to it, is documentaries where you have a single viewpoint where it's edited to help support their point and copying other documentarians. And uh, I am specifically pointing out our friend from this week we saw earlier, um, which is from Planet of the Humans. As much as I, I liked all the information that was provided, I, I like sometimes being kicked in the nuts when it comes to slapping people upside the head, saying we got to change the world. But uh, for me, I get really frustrated when I see documentaries where it's very one-sided and they're not leaving it for you to go do um, your own research or for anything like that. So when you bring in a, you bring in a director who's telling you all these 
foible about the green environment. Happy it was done. And I'm not just specifically pointing out him. Michael Moore is probably the worst um, person for this on the planet. He wants you to see his viewpoint. And it's been shown there's been documentaries about him and how terrible he is as a documentarian. And I lost my passion for Michael Moore a long time ago because of that reason. He, he gets on a, on a roll about, you know, you need to understand this point. And then he forgets to put in all the other details about things that would not necessarily support, support his point. And um, actually, you know, one of the ones that didn't make on our list, which is making me think angry that it wasn't, I'm assuming it should be animated, is uh, Team America. Why was that not on our list? I, that, well, that's uh, tricky, though, because it wasn't stop motion. It was puppets. Yeah, I know, but it, it's animated objects. So, hmm, maybe it's just, yeah, sorry, I got sidetracked there. But even <laughs> we learned about uh, Michael Moore and Team America. You know, I just, I'm so tired of documentaries. That almost made it to a rage for me. But the reason that it got went from rage to meh was because I really believe in what the message he was trying to put forward. I'm sorry. I just, I just can't get the sex scene from Team America out of my head right now. That was, that was like the, (laughs) so I didn't hear a thing you just said. Yeah. Well, now I'm, now you got me thinking about it, which makes me angry that we didn't have more puppet sex in all the other animated movies we've been seeing but there's a whole other side so yeah i'm am i angry about documentarians and um, so pu- puppets ain't animation let's let's get it there if, if you want to do a top 10 on puppets we can we can do that too there's plenty <laughs> there's plenty of content out there <laughs> yeah no so anyway document documentaries um oh we're talking about documentaries I, yeah well about one one-minded one vision documentary. It's kind of the uh, kind of what they do these days. I, I'm annoyed with that as well, man. I I, I can get on the bandwagon there. Um, I not ag- totally agree with on, on this one though because uh, I believe he did ask some questions to some people and they ended up looking pretty stupid because they didn't have the answers. He gave them a chance to to uh, uh, in in that doc to uh, argue their their point and, and they just didn't because they didn't have an, an oh. argument. Yeah, well, yeah, but those. To my point is that. But they not, should. He should have given it more time, and he should have not just, you know, ambushed them with it. Well, I don't mind ambush. I, I, what I didn't like about that film in particular, and the reason I'm pointing him out, is he's going. He wants you to take. He's taking you on a journey without without giving any other insight to other things, and that's becoming what Michael Moore is all about. And the fact that Michael Moore executive produced this, and as I was watching that last film. Uh, I was channeling Michael Moore. I'm like, the guy's voice was even sounding like Michael Moore at times. I'm like, is that Michael Moore that did the voiceover? But it wasn't. It was him. So it was like... <laughs> it didn't uh, sound like Michael Moore at all. <laughs> You're crazy. He, he did, man. It was annoying as fuck. And so what I, am, I am angry with documentaries that obviously that are bad, but also angry at documentaries that don't try and give you both sides and a more fluid vision for for the direction on their film. So that's, that's my rage. Sometimes there isn't another sometimes there isn't another side. I got to watch this Bill Gates thing that you keep on going on about cuz apparently it's filled you with such hope that you can't see the the trees through the forest. So Yeah, no, there's I'm telling you dude, you got to watch it. It's got it's put more hope in my heart than any movie I've ever seen. So, and it's not a movie, obviously it's a three-part documentary series. Um I'm sure I could go, someone's going to go and debunk all of the stuff about Bill Gates too. But when you see this film or that, that show, yeah. you're going to feel the same way. Yeah, at some point I'm going to watch it because good. you seem so optimistic. So I, I, I wouldn't mind a little optimism because man, that, as I say, that the doc you're talking about just bummed the hell out of me, but it's also bummed me out because it's, it's all just seems so true. Yeah. Well, when COVID's done and Donald Trump's out of power, we're probably going to see a big change the, come out of with the relationship with the, Bill Gates. The Koch brothers in the China. states are still going to be running energy and making billions of dollars, whether it's pseudo green or killing, you know, whatever. That's what they do. Well, I would say I'm challenging you. Go watch the Bill Gates stock. I will take that challenge. All right, all right. What you got this week, baby? Hmm. What do I got? Well, while well, you kind of enjoy all these different styles of animation, I'm kind of, uh, I'm sick of one type, to be honest. Ah, my rage this week 
I am tired of all the computer animation we are inundated with. Um, my top three animated films of all time have one awesome thing in common. They don't use any CGI. No computer generated images necessary. All three use stop motion animation. And I believe that if they were made with a computer instead, they would lose a lot of their heart. Um, there's something about stop motion that invites you into the story and makes you care more about the characters. The list of stellar stop motion features is a long one. Of course, there is the fantastic Mr. Fox and Isle of Dogs from Wes Anderson, as well as Adam Elliott's masterpiece, Ma Marion Max. Um, but there's also Corpse Bride, Frank and Weenie, The Nightmare Before Christmas, James and the Giant Peach, The Box Trolls, and Coraline. Uh, don't forget about Chicken Run and the delightful Wallace and Gromit movies from the Aardman Studios in England. Um, and let us also remember the technically superior effort from Charlie Kaufman and Duke Johnson, uh, 2015's Anomalisa. Um, it is a tragedy and a comedy and a drama, and it would not have had near the impact if it had been made with uh, CGI. Um, now, I really like the movie Up, as we both have said, but man... Imagine if that was made with stop motion. I think it would have been even better. That movie would have lended itself so well to that. Um, how much more impactful could it have been if Carl was not a computer generated image? Um, so with that, I say let's start relying on the technology less and the artistic talent more. Um, sometimes the way we used to do things makes it possible to convey more emotion than any computer ever could. Um, that is my rage. What do you say, Jim? Um, I say you're full of shit. I love CGI. I think if it's done well, and I, again, as much as I love The Nightmare Before Christmas, and I love everything about that film, and I love Fantasy Mr. Fox, number two. My number three is up, and I have, like I said, I, I don't think it could have been made me more cry more in the first 20 minutes from what uh, they depicted was, in that, yeah, in that it, first 20 minutes. It was a brilliant... It, it, it was a brilliant CGI story, and it was right. brilliantly done, but the CGI did nothing for me. Okay, so uh, here's a perfectly good example. We both love Alita Battle Monster. Monster? No, Alita Battle Angel. Sorry, we both love Alita Battle Angel. Yeah, it was good. Uh, right? That was C like that's that was that was a lot of CGI, but that wasn't an, that wasn't an animated movie per se. It wasn't. It was. It was no. It wasn't. But there was a shitload of CGI that was put there into was. it, and there was a lot of emotion that was done it. They did a really good job of blending CGI with, um, like I don't think anybody could have made that movie other than Rupert Rodriguez. And he's he's the king of CGI. Uh, I'm not. Like, I think we're. I think side. we're comparing apples and and oranges here, man. No, I don't think so. I think, I think, do I hate CGI when it's done badly? 100%. And do I also like the type of animation that you're talking? I do. I love it 100%. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm not a fan of the CGI animation at all. It's all just too yeah. smooth and I don't know. I it's like just, it's got, it's got, it's got no heart, man. It's got no well, heart. To, to your point, I have only two CGI movies in my top 10. There so you go. I, I feel your, I feel your, your point. But that's also the writing. If the writing is not good, if the writing is good and the CGI is great, the movie can be fantastic. Yes. So that's my rebuttal. I don't I don't need another CGI. Like, oh, man, you're just pumping out CGI animation after CGI animation, and it's just, it's depressing. Now, if you want to start talking about... Pen to paper, CGI man. Superhero movies, that's a whole other story. I jump on that bandwagon left and right. There you go. All right, sir. Well, from that... All right, so it is on to Rage or Dare. Yes. This week, I had to watch 1996 Matt LeBlanc epic monkey movie Ed. That's with the monkey playing baseball, right? It was playing baseball. Ah, that sounds but excellent. Was How was monkey, it? But it wasn't a monkey, I can tell you that. It was a chimpanzee. Uh, no, it wasn't a chimpanzee either. Oh, was it, it was like an actor in a suit. Was it really? I didn't even remember that. 
That makes oh, it even really? better. <laughs> Of course. So I thought this was going to be so cheesy. Uh, I would love it. Uh, so here's my here's my recap. All right. Uh, first off, Meatloaf song starts it right in the middle of nowhere. Um, really? Nice. Okay, I'm interested. Meatloaf in the in the music. Wow. Joey from Friends was like a little baby and zero percent body fat. Yeah, he, he <laughs> ballooned up, eh? He wasn't. He wasn't famous enough to get fat. Um, this Starving has all actor. The staples. It has all the staples of a great movie. Funny monkeys, baseball, and um, oh, I forgot Joey from Friends. The only thing it was missing was a musical number. Wait, it had meatloaf. Nice. First off, it had kids thinking they were smart interacting with adults. Do you know what that means? No. That starts with a one. <laughs> ah. And it has to work its way up. It had a monkey, which is played by two different people, not a monkey. And the only people <laughs> who could not figure out that it wasn't a monkey is perhaps the people who have the same IQ of a monkey. <laughs> uh, and most of the people in this movie were dumber than the pretend monkey. Nice. Uh, <laughs> oh. Oh my god the only thing funny about this was the monkey was a pig no wait the fake woman playing the monkey was a male pig yeah, yeah i'm not even following right. you but yeah uh, are you confused yeah i was a little confused too cool uh was was that dire straight single in the soundtrack yep <laughs> that was four minutes of awesome uh wait the soundtrack was actually pretty amazing apparently that's all where the budget went Last song was by the Ramones. Ah, uh, bliss. The music brought it all the way back to a man. It had so much potential to be a rage, but the ending with with um, the Ramones brought it all the way up to a man for the soundtrack alone. Just, just ending with the Ramones made it a man. <laughs> no, it was a hard rage, buddy. I couldn't get past. I couldn't get past the first scene where they brought the monkey in, and it was a person. I was like, "What?" I'm getting ripped like, off here. They promised me a monkey. Exactly, and they, you know, at least in the Clint Eastwood orangutan movies, they use a real fucking orangutan. True enough. So they, like this, this movie lost so much money at the box office. And I say, if they would have had a real chimpanzee, or how about a CGI chimpanzee? Get out of here. Actually, I would have loved to see a CGI chimpanzee in 1996. That would have been awesome. It would have been as funny as two bad actors in a monkey costume. But, uh, yeah, it was a hard rage. There is an actual chimp on the poster, though, isn't it? Or is that the... No, well, I don't know. It might be a chimp on the poster, but it's definitely not a chimp in the movie. Mm. It's it's an actor walking around as a chimp. All right. And it's played, when you look into it further, there's two two different actors that play the the chimp. Two different actors. Yeah. Like the Olsen twins back in uh, Full House days. Maybe maybe it was the Olsen twins. Maybe it was. They do act like a little bunch of crazy monkeys, that's for sure. Yes. So, yeah, you you got your wish. It made me rage. Nice. But I did love, I have to do say, when they ended the movie with the Ramones, I was like, okay. I almost had second thought. <laughs> All right, so sir. This week, we're both on the hit list. We got a pull from Murray Sweet Bag. We have. So I have taken the liberty of reaching my hand into the bag. I have pulled out a piece of paper. I am unfolding this piece of paper as we speak. This is a movie that we will both have to watch. And, um, you know what? I don't really remember it. It's one of the, the, uh, it's a movie that's been panned as a lot of people have called it the worst movie ever made. I honestly don't remember it. Um, huh. well, you quit, don't leave me in suspense, bitch. Uh, it's called, um, Howard the Duck. Oh my God. I love Howard the Duck. This is going to be a Mondo already. <laughs> you already know it's going to be a... I saw it so long ago, and I, I, I don't remember really having an opinion about it at that time. Um, but yeah, I'm actually looking forward to watching it again. Let's see what ha- let's this, see what it has to offer. This may be a this may be a total dud week for Rage or Dare because yeah. this may be end up being a mess. 
It may be. Who knows? Yeah. Um, how is the duck? I don't think there's any CGI in this, buddy. It's, it's a guy walking around in a duck suit. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and uh, the who's the actress in it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, they know it's somebody. Um, it's like Emma something. Is it Emma? I'll find out in a second. Isn't it the, the chick uh, from... Leah Thompson. Leah, Leah Thompson. Thompson. Leah Thompson. That's yeah. it. Jeffrey Jones, Tim Robbins, uh, Ed Gale plays Howard the Duck. Uh, Chip Zeen, Tim Rose, who plays uh, Admiral What's His Face. Yeah, this may not be a terrible, terrible week. Yeah. Howard All the right. Duck. Howard the Duck. Well, let's see. What, let's see. Uh, Murray's been pretty good with uh, making us rage so far, but maybe he missed the boat yeah. on this one. We'll see. Might have missed the boat. Yep. All, All right, right well, sir. That's it for Rage or Dare. Now we got uh, we got contest winners to announce. Ah, go ahead. Yeah, so we had a Instagram contest, and I want to thank everybody who submitted. Uh, we ended up drawing the names, and these are our winners. So we've got some um, from Instagram. We have uh, at R Bro One Two Three uh, is one of the winners, and they are from the states. And uh, official ridiculous. Patronus. Also, and if you follow us on Instagram, uh, you will uh, be able to follow these people because they're posted and follow us. So you can you can follow us. Um, and then uh, we have at Katie.yyc from Instagram. And then uh, we've got and this. This is obviously a pseudonym, but uh, Blue Flemington two four seven from Apple and iTunes. And Lady Gray from our website. So um, congratulations to the winners. We're going to get you out some film rage swag. Uh, so people listening, if you're interested, we're going to be bringing more swag out in the future. So uh, keep listening for other ways for us to uh, grant you some swag. And like us, thank us, do all those things. And I guess that kind of leads us night right into our closing. I guess it does. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Ragers, for listening. Thanks to the extended film rage crew of Murray on sabbatical, Leonard Conlon for his artistic vision, and photography via... Oh, my God, I screw this every time. And photography via Leonard Conlon Photography. Uh, and our new cartoonist, artist, Vaughn. Uh, listen to us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and check out our website at filmrageyyc.com there's lots of good stuff on there all the time we are always wanting your feedback to make this a raging blast for all listeners so please comment often please make us rage please please make us rage that's it for this week rage on rage on